Welcome to the Times of Industry show. Today I have a repeat guest. To say. I mean, the, this guy is brilliant. I love him. Um, I read a lot of his work, and we're in good contact. Uh, Luis Camarasano, smallgold.com. That's S M A U L G L D.com. Um, great stuff always over there. Very provocative. And what I really like about Luis is that he is totally an independent thinker. And uh, wh whatever you're going to hear on this interview is original and it's Luis's own thoughts about what's going on right now, what to think about. Uh, but he's not going to tell you what to think. He's just going to tell you what he's thinking himself and how you should uh, be thinking uh, for yourself. How but not what, which is exactly the opposite of what every financial uh, mainstream media wants you to do. They want you to, to think whatever they uh, have an agenda for you to think. And independent thinkers love to teach people how to think and not what to think. Louis, thanks for being on the show. Well, Lear, thank you for that introduction. And that is basically how I like to present my work. Uh, well, uh, let me ask you this. Let's start with what I, what the uh, chairman of, uh, of Hive Blockchain Technologies, Frank Holmes, loves to talk about, which is the love trade. So, Everyone thinks that people buy gold for the fear trade. They, they want to protect themselves from fiat currencies, from inflation, from uh, currency crisis, catastrophe, natural disasters, geopolitical tensions, all of the fear trade um, that we keep hearing about, the, the, uh, the, the budget deficits, etc. But <clears throat> um, we have to remember that there's a love trade as well, and not only a fear trade. Could you talk about the love trade or, or what we call the seasonal... Um, uh, the seasonal uh, buying of gold for jewelry reasons. All right. Well, you're absolutely right that people that follow precious metals as either a hobby or they're in the industry and they follow economics and they follow geopolitical concerns, they always point to the negative implications of something going wrong in the economy or in the political situation or we have inflation. So they start to think about gold and silver as a hedge and there's nothing in that narrative that's incorrect that it's absolutely true that people look to gold and silver however the majority of people don't think about these types of risks are not well educated in economics not well educated in politics other than just the basic partisan stuff that goes on back and forth and they don't really buy gold for that reason or sell gold there's really a smaller subset of people who are actually bullion buyers. And in some respects, a lot of those bullion buyers are buying less physical and they're actually buying ETFs. They're looking for a trade. So they're not even really hedging themselves with a physical asset. And, However, and, and by the way, just I'm sorry to interrupt, but it's very important because I wrote about it just recently. And, and I don't think they even uh, they even influence the spot price of gold when the G, when they buy GLD that much. They're, they're not creating a constraint on real supply. Uh, they're just creating more outstanding shares of the GLD. And I agree with that. And I think actually that's that's a problem. And that's why, indeed, the financial system advocates if you have to buy gold, buy it in this form because they control whatever supply is in there. And, you know, they claim that there's twenty five hundred tons and all these ETFs and that the flows go in and out. I just don't understand the mechanics of how 50 tons can flow in and out of these uh, ETFs each and every month. When you buy your ETF share and you trade it, I, I don't see how they can keep up with all of that. But that's that's neither here nor there. The idea is that most people who are thinking about collapse are a very small subset of people, and they don't account for a lot of physical buying. However, in a society that is getting wealthy, in a society that's doing well, you hear about golden eras and uh Societies getting wealthier, wealthier, like the Chinese have over the last 15, 20 years, like the Indians have. They then take their disposable income and they want to show off their wealth. They want to show it off in the form of adornment, uh, jewelry. And what most people who even follow gold and silver closely are not aware of that gold demand on an annual basis is 50 for, for jewelry is 52 percent and investment demand is half of that. So that means that there's more demand for people who are buying jewelry outside of any concept of trading it, outside of any concept of worrying about 
uh, collapse or inflation. They're buying it because they can buy, because they have money, because they're wealthy now and they weren't wealthy 20 years ago in China. Same with India. Indians have always bought gold, but Indians weren't buying gold in a sense to protect themselves against a lot of, they were really buying it because they just viewed it as a store of value. And they were going to pass it on from generation to generation. And they were buying uh, gold jewelry. They were buying items, fair, family heirlooms. But now today you have about 300 to 350 million Indians who are middle class that weren't middle class. And that's the size of the United States population that weren't middle class 25, 30 years ago. And again, they're not thinking when they buy a silver bracelet or a silver necklace or silver rings or silver statues about protecting themselves against some inevitable collapse. They're actually buying it because they can buy it. And silver demand for jewelry is also twice the amount as it is for investment demand. I think last year, according to the Silver Institute, the silver demand for silverware and jewelry. Now, silverware is odd because Americans don't buy silverware anymore, but they do in India. The, the total amount of ounces going to satisfy silverware and silver jewelry was 230 million or 260 million. And for silver coins, rounds and bars, it was just 130. So you see how there's a larger segment of the population that's not involved in this deep analysis. They don't listen to wealth research group. They certainly don't listen to small gold. They don't go to silver doctors. More mainstream people that are not as intimately involved or extensively involved in economics, uh, they're buying silver outside for that for that reason. Also, with silver, as you were mentioning, we know that silver is between 60 and 75 percent, depending on the year goes towards industrial. Well, when you have a good economic times, not only do people have money and they buy gold and silver jewelry for adornment, but uh, industry requires, because the economy is doing better, more silver in its industrial applications. Now, a lot of people are listening probably or and saying, but wait, what about the collapse? What about the unfunded liabilities? What about the deficit? What about the debt? It's unsustainable. Yes, of course. And at some point, you will have an issue with all that, and there will be some type of collapse. However, during that time period, wealth or the creation of debt does flow into people's pockets so that they do have more disposable income. And as we've seen in China, lest we not forget, China has created massive amounts of credit, and a good portion of their wealth is due to that credit creation. And at some point, the Chinese Board of Governors of the PBOC, People's Bank of China, has warned they may have reached a Minsky moment where they can't stimulate their economy anymore. However, during the period of time of which they are stimulating, the people do have money. Now, bring it over to the United States. The We're moving away from monetary stimulus. We haven't done QE. The United States hasn't done quantitative easing means it's not printing money and buying bonds, and it's gotten off the zero interest rates. It's now up to, I think, the Fed funds rate is 1.75. But the United States has now moved to fiscal stimulus, which is an even more powerful way of putting money in people's hands than monetary stimulus. Because when you lower interest rates and you print money, that helps the people that either have the money already to buy assets or already sitting on assets. And we've seen that. It drives the stock markets higher. It drives real estate higher. But fiscal stimulus in the form of what Congress does in tax cuts actually gives people, even in the middle class, a thousand, two thousand extra dollars a year. Now, I would dare say when people have more money at some point, it does go into items that require disposable income. And some of that could be gold and jewelry if people are inclined to still buy gold rings, engagement rings, which I believe they are. So your gentleman who talks about the love trade, I'll give him credit for calling it the love trade. I would go one, for, one step further and call it the wealth trade because all the gold demand in India and China that's putting a floor on the gold price is not based on a collapsed narrative. It's based on the fact that they are now wealthier. It could be, you know, the wealth is from an unsustainable credit boom or, or credit uh, creation. But nonetheless, it does put money in people's hands, yuan, rupee, whatever it is, and they do indeed buy gold and silver with it. And they buy it not in the form of bullying the stack, but in the form of gold and silver jewelry. Now, Louis, in May, uh, U.S. inflation had uh, gone up to 2.8%. <clears throat> Obviously, the, uh, the average is about 25 So this, is, this isn't extreme. 
Um, but should people do anything else with their portfolio, judging by the fact that the that the inflation is hitting its peak for for this cycle? Well, I don't give investment advice, and I don't really know what you should do. But I will say that the inflation rate, if you whatever decision you're going to make based on the inflation rate, I would guess that the inflation rate is going to go higher for a number of reasons. First, the Fed wants it to go higher. So they're not going to do anything to try to stop inflation yet unless they see it get out of hand. And they've always indicated they'd rather be late on stopping inflation than early. Second, you have the tax cuts and the stimulus. So if that actually puts more money in people's hands, they buy products, they bid them up precisely at the time. If these tariffs expand to a lot of different areas, especially from China and finished goods, then those prices are also going to be higher, which means then. You have price inflation. And if oil prices continue to rise, you're going to have the same issue. So we now have what I had been talking about for a couple of years was Trump turmoil. I always thought that Trump would create turmoil both politically but also economically because he was always threatening to renegotiate these deals. And now he's doing it. And also because he's created tremendous backlash amongst his political opponents. So you get political uncertainty. You get inflation. Those are recipes for higher inflation, and also traditionally what makes people move into gold to, quote, protect themselves. But during that time period, you could also have people, a segment of the population, larger segment of the population, earning more disposable income and turning that into jewelry. So there's a possibility, I'm just throwing it out there as almost as a thought experiment, that gold and silver demand, if it does indeed, physical gold and silver demand does indeed impact the price, which we've seen it generally doesn't because of the Comex futures trading, but that gold and silver demand could come from uh, an improving U.S. economy. And I know people are going to say, but the debt, the debt, you can still have an improving economy like they have in China, even though you're piling on massive debt, because what you're doing is you're bringing the demand forward, even though you're borrowing from the future. It doesn't mean that that wealth isn't here now. It just means you borrowed to get it, and eventually you're going to have to pay it back. So you could have a period where there's money in the system, people have it, and they buy gold and silver jewelry. Now, I, I want to talk about the fact that we've gone through six months of the year already, and the stock market is, uh, well, <clears throat> if 2017 was the year of hope, then 2018 is the year of reality sinking in. Um, and a lot of the, uh, the stock market gains that we've seen throughout this bull market, they've not been here for 2018. Do you see this as the end of the bull market or is this a breather? It's it's it is a transition period for sure. It can go either way because what we've seen is the prices go up, they go down. They've been basically flatlining all year. And a large portion of that is uncertainty. And stock markets don't like uncertainty. The tariffs do bring in a lot of uncertainty. But at some point, what will happen with the tariffs is the market will make a judgment. This is going to help the U.S. or it's going to hurt China or it's going to hurt the U.S. and help China. If you see that people start to realize this might hurt China more, then you're going to see the stock market and the dollar be the preferred place where people are going to move their assets because they're concerned. I err on the side that the United States will do better than China, mostly because China wasn't ready for this. China is a centrally planned economy. They counted on shipping a net export to the U.S. of 500 billion. They weren't counting on that changing really anything at all. They've already done their their central planning on the basis that the factories that produce those goods would produce give or take a certain amount. They knew how many people were going to be employed. They knew what their non-performing loans were going to be on that basis. Even though they were high, they felt they could manage it. They could try to deleverage at the same time. But their model did not have in it the United States putting. 34 billion and then 50 billion and then up to 500 billion dollars worth of tariffs. That creates an enormous strain on the Chinese economy. And the way the Chinese have to react is they then have to, well, they can't just let the United States get away with it. So they have to put tariffs on U.S. goods. The problem is there's not as many U.S. goods that they get compared to what the uh, U.S. imports from China. So, for example, they've recently put tariffs on soybeans and oil things that they need and also things in their model that they weren't counting on paying more for probably. So now that they have taxes on soybeans, that may hurt the U.S. farmer, although I saw they made a deal to export uh, some soybeans to Brazil. 
they now have to go and get their oil from Iran, which they're not going to get any cheaper than they are from the United States. And now you have geopolitical issues because China is dealing with the enemy. They're dealing with Iran. So this whole thing can spiral out of control. I think the issue with the Chinese economy is that they have more people in cities with an expectation. I think they moved about 300 to 400 million people from the farms into the cities over the last 10, 15 years. And they have an expectation that they're going to have a job and they're going to get fed. And otherwise, they could have a very uh, interesting situation of political turmoil on their hands with civil unrest. Whereas in the United States, the worst that could happen, and it's not good, is that you have significant price inflation on a lot of finished goods because the U.S. won't be able to ramp up toasters and refrigerators and washing machines fast enough and they're going to have to pay the higher tariff price. And that could create also political uncertainty in the U.S., and that could create problems for the Republicans, problems for Trump. But again, those things can be there. I don't think they are as dire as what might happen if China lost 500 billion or something, not 500 billion, but some portion of that 500 billion in uh, exports to the United States, because 23 percent of Chinese exports go to the U.S., they can't just say, oh, forget about that. Whereas the United States only ha of its foreign trade only exports 8% to China. So the trade imbalance is already there. And you could argue the United States isn't reliant on its exports to China the way China is reliant on its exports to the U.S. Now, Luis, what do you really think of the Trump administration uh, with regards to what it's doing uh, with the trade war angle? What's really behind this? What's What's the end game or what's the sophistication behind this? Because obviously in the mainstream media, they always talk about what's called the first level um, ramifications. And they always forget to talk about the second level and third level ramifications of anything that we do. There's two, there's two elements of it. There's political and there's economic. The political is very easy to see that. The United States, you know, he went to Wisconsin, he won Wisconsin, Michigan, those areas, Ohio, used to have significant manufacturing, significant steel jobs. Pennsylvania, he won too. He won all that on the basis of saying that uh, we've been sold out by the globalists, the multinationals, NAFTA, China, they're ripping us off. That resonated with a lot of the blue collar workers that used to have those jobs. We had Obama go out to, I think it was Carrier, and he said, uh, these jobs are gone and they're not coming back. What, 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 what's he going to do? He doesn't have an answer. So basically, he, you had the difference between Trump promising he was going to bring manufacturing back. And to a certain extent, he started to do that. But basically, they're cheering on these Chinese tariffs because they believe ultimately it's going to help the United States. Now, on the economic side, there's also an economic risk, but there's also a potential economic benefit in that you balance the trade. And there's also a benefit that there could be a benefit to the, the world um, economy if the trade war, the tariffs cause a renegotiation of lower tariffs across the board between the countries the United States trades with. When you have lower tariffs, you'll have even more trade than you had before. Right now, it appears that China has a one-way ticket into the United States and the U.S. has a limited ticket into China. So I would imagine China will have to work out its model to accommodate more foreign investment into China, which right now you can only own 49% of a Chinese company if you're a foreigner. They're going to have to think about if they want to internationalize the yuan, if they're going to get rid of capital controls, or if they can commit to never doing these devaluations of the yuan. So it'll actually could possibly turn out to be better for China, because right now China is working on an artificial uh, system where they basically can export goods at will to the rest of the world and then try to control their economy internally. And now that they're trying to go out into the real world and, and do belt and road financing, they're running up against that they can't control what happens in the outside world. So getting back to Trump, what Trump is doing is political, but he's also and I don't know if I can give him credit for what might happen economically. I mean, he could step in it and it could all work out. He also could not know what he's doing because trade wars require when he says they're easy to win, they're easy to win, I would imagine, if you know exactly how you're responding, you know, you know where the pieces are going to move when you make your move, what they're going to do, what the impact is going to be, and so on. So I think he's in a position where he's trying to satisfy his base, but he, and also he's trying to win 
the trade war such that the United States comes out better economically and then possibly win over more than just his base. Yeah, so it's always about the unknown unknowns, uh, as, as we know. Um, now, Luis, I want to ask you a final question, and it has to do more with uh, millennials, which are uh, one of my favorite subjects because people underestimate the purchasing power of millennials and they underestimate uh, the millennial demographic group, but they're the biggest demographic group right now in America. Um, obviously, with 6.8 million job openings and with 6.8 people, uh, 6.8 million people looking for jobs, you, you would uh, you would reason that there would be no job op openings because all the jobless people would uh, occupy those uh, you know the, those openings. But there's a problem with talent and skill. In other words, th these um, employees are not skilled enough or trained enough to work at some of these industries. There's a there's a big problem here um, with baby boomers exiting the workforce, leaving very high income jobs, but there's no one to replace them. Uh, and so you see a lot of uh, uh, companies paying overtime and making people stay longer w with obviously with the incentive of higher wages. Is, is this uh, obviously, uh, I, I want to talk about how this will change in the next few years as millennials do get real world experience and they start to leave their parents' house and build their own lives. And will this be enough to sustain a bull market for stocks? Are millennials going to buy stocks or is it going to be more uh, to the effect of what uh, Jeremy Siegel said in, in his book, Stocks for the Long Run? where the Asian buying power will start buying American companies and you will see a lot of uh, foreign owners, foreign majority owners for uh, U.S. stocks. Okay, there's a couple of points there. One is the Harry Dent demographic, which makes sense that if the younger generation doesn't have as much money and the boomers are retiring and selling, then the younger people won't be there if they don't have the money to buy the stock. Now, we've seen that millennials don't have the same interest in buying baseball cards, uh, physical commodities like coins, stamps, uh, antique jewelry. They live in a digital world. Those items don't mean much to them. So clearly those types of collector markets will get hit. However, the difference with the stock market, as you alluded to with the Siegel reference, is the average person is not necessarily the one making up the bulk of the stock buying. What we've seen over the last five, ten years are central banks and other large institutions really taking up the bulk of the buying. So you got the Swiss National Bank. You and I did a show on this a couple of years ago, how they're buying $100 billion worth of equities. Well, they're replacing all the millennials there who might have bought those $100 billion and of equities. But buying back their own shares. Exactly. And companies buying back their own shares. So you're basically moving the stock market away from where there would be less demand in the terms of the individual investor. Now, they're still involved in pension funds and, and 401ks, but you're seeing central bank and institutional picking up the slack. And also, as we were talking about with China, if the U.S. becomes seen as the safe haven in the trade war, foreign capital will flow into the U.S. stock market. So if if Harry Dent is, was his model worked on, there's a certain number of buyers and they're boomers and they're going away and there's a certain number of uh, they're becoming sellers and there's a limited number and there's the same number of buyers, but they're less inclined to buy because they don't have the money and they're millennials. Then therefore, the stock prices would continue to go down. He'd be right. But that's not how the stock market is shaking out now. And not only Harry Dent, the, this is, goes back to the year 2000 with the Robert Kiyosaki book, The Prophecy, where he talks about the the demographic cliff. Uh, there have been countless of books talking about the fact that when the boomers retire and need to sell their real estate and their stocks, they're not going to be a buyer in there uh, to buy them. That's why I was so intrigued by that subject and uh, obviously read the counter theory to that in, in which um, Asian buying will supply the, the demand and all that kind of stuff. So uh, definitely an interesting subject. Uh, um, and, and you were saying about this well, the the other thing about millennials and their inability, they're saying that you know they can't fill the the higher paying jobs because they don't have the skills. And one of the ways that the United States is making up for those skills was the the visa program. And I had read that uh, it was like a single digit percentage 
of native born Americans actually graduate college universities with advanced math degrees. It's just too hard. So what they've done to college is they've dumbed it down. And of course, then they issue foreign visas and Asians will come to the United States realizing this is why they came here and they're going to study and they're going to learn the math and they're going to graduate with the math degree and potentially get a job in the U.S., which creates a brain drain in, in Asia. But notwithstanding that, the American millennials have basically been spoon fed mostly social uh, learnings, uh, feminism, uh, things like uh, gender studies, collectivism, but nothing about real economics, more about social justice. Now, the problem I have with that is whether whether you believe in social justice or you think it's just uh, empty words, you don't need to go to college to learn that. It's not a rigorous study that requires you to sit in a classroom, borrow $30,000 a year to learn. You can, you can learn that online. The, the reason for, in my mind, to universities is not to teach those kind of things. And maybe you have one course in it, but it's not to major in it, but it's to actually learn things that require academic rigor and not just opinion and feelings. And I think that's what makes them not um, able to take on some of these higher skilled jobs. And it's not just college. It starts before college. You see the Detroit school system is a total mess. They recently had a lawsuit there. They were claiming they had a right to literacy. The court said literacy is very important, but it's not guaranteed to by the Constitution. But the issue you have is that the schools are failing and then because the schools fail and the colleges don't want to give up, they don't want to raise their emissions requirements. They change their emissions requirements. And then the government backs student loans to go into college. So everyone goes to college and still doesn't learn anything that requires any academic rigor. So they graduate and, and they graduate in debt. And that makes it even less likely that they're ever going to be able to buy stocks and houses, even if they wanted to buy houses and antique jewelry and antique furniture and so on. They won't have the money. So something has to give. What I think will happen is the companies will realize that they're going to have to train their own workers. They're going to have to invest the money in training workers. And maybe what they should do, instead of hiring kids out of college, they should hire them out of high school and start training them right then and there. Because you're going to get them out of college and they're not going to be any better suited to do the job after college than they would be if they got them when they were in high school. So smart organizations will drop the concept that you need a college degree to do most of the jobs. I remember when I when I was running a company, one of the most important skills you can have, it, to my mind, was the ability to analyze data on a very rudimentary basis on a spreadsheet and manipulate the spreadsheet and give me some type of analysis and some type of uh, plan of what you should do with the data now that you know X number of people are doing this, Y number of people are doing that. What action items do we get from that data? You never learn that in college. You don't even learn how to use Excel in college. So if I were running a company today, a large company, I would have Excel classes. I would have a whole bunch of things teaching people about supply and demand, teaching people customer service. The, the idea that you go to college and learn any of that, you don't. You just spend a lot of money to learn some concepts. Yeah. Well, the, the only reason to really go to college is for networking uh, and finding potential partners, I, I would say. Um, but you can do that in, in other networking groups. I have I have uh, an high school education myself, um, Louis, and then I ventured into the business world. So I, I am a proponent of real-life experience. And <clears throat> what I did personally, uh, I don't know if you uh, know my story a little bit, but uh, I went to the house of someone I wanted to be mentored by and I knocked in his house with a business plan and uh, he said the businessman uh, the businessman sucks but uh, that I would uh, be able to work for him for free for six months and learn to tr and learn some of the trade that was in the real estate business um, and that's how I got started there but so my my vision has always been hey find a person find a company find somewhere that will teach you everything that you need and then you can venture out on your own uh, and that's how I've I've done this. And um, you you just look for people that can offer you value. Uh, people you know, that... they say hire hire for attitude. You can always teach them the skills, but most companies don't. They hire that they think because somebody went to college, they have some type of pedigree, and therefore they're able to do the job. No, they're able to sit through a bunch of classes and drink beer on the weekend. That doesn't. I mean, I'm downplaying college because of the price that you pay. You think for the price that you pay for college you would come out and you would have these superior skills and you would have real 
uh, leverage in the job market, you don't. And there's a reason you don't, because everyone else has one. And everyone else, not only does everyone else have one, everyone else has the same mediocre degree you have. Sure. Um, I want to ask you one final question, uh, and, and this is this has to do more with what's going to happen uh, in, in terms of the bonds market. The bonds market is the biggest one in the world, except for uh, the foreign currency market. And um, we are seeing a situation where if inflation goes up, plus rates go up, uh, we are going to see a very uh, bad bear market for bonds. And people are going to lose a lot of money. Uh, people are, will, will potentially lose more equity than homeowners in 2008 if this goes real bad. Um, where do you think that bond investors will go in, in, to, to get income and yield going forward? Because what we've done in Wealth Research Group is we've focused on MLPs and on RITs. And I think people need to understand that there's other options instead of bonds for fixed income investors. I've recently um, talked about Peer Street and how you can make loans to people outside the stock market so you don't even care what the stock market is doing and you get high, high yield income uh, from that as well. So c can you talk about some solutions and, and what do you think about the bond market in general? The first thing I thought of when you mentioned that was not even REITs, but people can actually invest in real estate and get a return. The problem with the bond market is it's in a 30-year bull market. They've taken rates down. When rates go higher, the bond price becomes cheaper. And right now what you're having, we had rising bond prices and, and lowering yields, and that's they got to come off the dime. They have to, the ECB, the Bank of Japan, all these countries can't have zero rate forever. The EU Fed's already realized that. So the bond prices are going to get hurt. And people, if they're going to be yield investors, they're going to have to go looking for uh, other alternative investments. You could have REITs. The other thing is the push, they'll still go into the stock market. But I think then you also have dividend plays in stocks. One of the things I wanted to do, my own research is maybe you guys will do it, is is look at some of the um, the publicly traded companies that actually are doing um, dividends. Uh, also, there's the ability to earn interest on gold. There's some interesting things going on in that area. So you're right, there's going to be, and I'd be interested in looking at your report, a lot of areas where people who are yield hungry for whatever reason, whether they want to retire or whether they are um, in a in a fund, a bond fund right now, they want to get out. They're going to have to look for places that are going to provide yield. And the sovereign bonds and some of the corporate bonds aren't going to be the way. And a lot of people aren't going to want to just go into high yield bonds because you're taking a very serious risk. So you could also have some convertible bonds where you get a yield and then you take equity. So you're right. There's going to need to be a lot of creative thinking in finance to how to replace and find homes for money that wants a yield. Sure, and, and we actually have a giant library about dividends and compounding if you go to wealthresearchgroup.com forward slash dividend. So we are building this giant library about this. It's an important subject. Uh, Louis, let's, uh, let's ask you, where can people follow your work? How can people uh, check out more from you and, and going forward, uh, uh, stay consistent with what you're doing and update it? All right. Well, the best thing to do right now for the last three weeks, I've been doing a nightly live stream and there's no shortage of topics. And I spend about 10 to 25 minutes on whatever the topic is, just based on the research that I have. Then I take questions. But you can go to the Small Gold website, smallgold.com. I post all of the the YouTubes there and all of my original research on smallgold.com. And then also any place where there's social media, Gab, Steemit, Facebook, Twitter, Google Plus, you can find Smoggle. But the best two places to go, and, and BitChute, are to go to smoggle.com as a first resource because that encompasses all the other work that I do, including the BitChute and the YouTube. And I also incorporate a lot of Twitter in my blog post analysis from my Twitter feed. So I would start with the smoggle.com. Luis Camarasano, thank you very much. Very smart guy, brilliant researcher. Love to have you back on the show. I'd love to be back, and thank you very much for having me on, Leroy.